study number 12, we're going to look at the spirit of prophecy. And this is perhaps one of the most important subjects that we're going to look at. And because it's so important, we, of course, we have to follow scripture. And I want us to turn now to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. And there it says, and the dragon was wroth with woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now, you may remember we've looked at what a woman represents, and a woman in Bible prophecy represents the church. If it's a good woman, it's God's people. If it's a bad woman, then it's those who have rebelled against God in a religious sense. But now we're looking at this woman, and the dragon goes to make war with the remnant of the woman's seed. That's God's people. And God's people are described as having the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, you also will note that the position where this verse falls in Revelation chapter 12, it's after the 1,260 days. And you may remember that in our studies, there has been this constant theme of this time when a fallen church had precedence over God's church, as it were. God's church went into the wilderness for that period of time and then came out and then a remnant church appears after the time of the church coming out of the wilderness. Now, we know that the church came out of the wilderness some point after 1798 and there are two qualities that this church actually possesses which are mentioned here in Revelation 12, 17. It says, first of all, the church keeps the commandments of God. And it doesn't say the church keeps some of the commandments of God. It doesn't say that it keeps most of the commandments of God. It says it keeps the commandments of God. That's all 10 of the commandments. And then secondly, it has the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this is an interesting term that's used here. And what does this actually mean for a church to have the testimony of Jesus? Well, if we look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10, here then is an explanation where it says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, now this is the angel that's talking to John. He says to John, don't do this. I am your fellow servant. I am from your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. He says, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, I'm sure this is not the first time that you're reading this verse. I'm sure that you're way ahead of me with this. You're saying, okay, yes, the definition of the testimony of Jesus is that it's the spirit of prophecy. But did you know that in the King James Version, this phrase is used only once in the entire Bible, only in this verse? So if we're going to say, well, what does that actually mean? If we're going to ask the Bible to interpret the Bible, we're going to have a little bit of a problem here because this is the only verse where it says it. Now, of course, we can look at other places in Paul's writings, for example, where he says that prophecy is one of the gifts that are imparted by the Holy Spirit. We're looking here at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 to 10, where it says, for to one is given the Spirit, sorry, for, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. Now those who have the gift, the gift of prophecy, are called therefore prophets. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, go down to verse 28. Here Paul continues. He says, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and then after that miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now it's an interesting thing here. 
because you know some churches say that the test the mark of having the holy spirit is that you speak in tongues but you will notice that paul puts tongues right down the bottom of the list he doesn't say this is something that everybody has to do he doesn't say that everybody who has the holy spirit will speak in tongues and he puts a lot of other people above a lot of other gifts rather he puts above this idea of speaking in tongues now also revelation chapter 22 verses 8 and 9 but particularly verse 9 also talks about those who have the spirit of prophecy as being prophets and uses very similar language to revelation 19 10 and if we look at them both side by side here you can see on revelation 19 10 i fell at his feet to worship him he said to me see that thou do it not i am thy fellow servant and of my brethren that have the testimony of jesus worship god for the testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy and revelation 22 9 and then he said unto me see you do it not for i am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of the book worship god so it's interesting you see this similar phraseology being used here in fact if we go on a little bit um no sorry i'm going to turn actually to herman strathman now herman strathman wrote a book called the theological dictionary of the new testament and this is what he says he says according to the parallel in revelation 22 9 the brothers referred to here are not believers in general but they are specifically the prophets here too they are characterized as such this is the point of verse 10 that's 1910 if they have a now he refers to it here strathman refers to it as being the maturia yesu the testimony of jesus they have the spirit of prophecy i.e they are prophets and as such they stand alongside the divine who is himself a prophet like the angel who simply stands in the service of the maturia jesu of the spirit of, of testimony of jesus now moffat also talks about this in his book the revelation of saint john the divine and he says this prose marginal comment specifically it defines the brethren who hold the testimony of jesus as possessors of prophetic inspiration the testimony of jesus is practically equivalent to jesus testifying now if you had used that phrase uh, in john's day the Jews of that time would have known exactly what was being referred to here because there was an equivalence between certain expressions Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, Spirit of Yahweh and all of these were equivocated as being with the spirit of prophecy and we can actually demonstrate this by reference to the translation of the Old Testament in the Aramaic this is called the Targums so I'm going to step outside the, the normal translation of the Old Testament, but you can follow me in your Bibles. We're going to turn to Revelation 41 and verse 38. And here you can see reference. In fact, I'm just going to look it up in the, um, in the King James Version, just so we can have a good idea of what the difference is. I'm pretty sure you've got King James Versions there. So you have a look at it yourself so let's follow along what it with what it says this is pharaoh speaking to his servants so let's say genesis chapter 41 and we're looking at verse 38 and here it says and pharaoh said unto his servants can we find such a man as this a man in whom the spirit of god is but notice in the Targums, in the Aramaic version, it says, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of prophecy from the Lord? Now, I'm just pulling up here. Look, this is my Aramaic version of the Bible here, because I'm just thinking whilst we're doing this, let's, let's have a look and let's check it. Again, Genesis 41 and verse 38. 
Yeah, and here it says, and Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a man as this in whom the spirit of God is? But it's the spirit of prophecy. It's referred to as being in the Targums. Now, this is not the only place where we will find this being mentioned. So let's look at Numbers chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. And again, follow this in the King James Version and just see what the, the very slight difference is. Here it says, and the Lord was revealed in the glorious cloud of the Shekinah and spake with him, and he made enlargement of the spirit of prophecy that was upon him. So that Moshe, this is Moses, lost nothing thereof, but he gave unto the seventy men the elders, and it was that when the spirit of prophecy rested upon them, they prophesied and ceased not. Now, don't you find that interesting, the difference that it makes just by looking at a slightly different rendering of the text? Now, if we go to, again, let, let me just go to numbers in my Bible here. If I can remember where to find it, I've gone right past it there. Let's have a look. Numbers chapter 11. Here it is, Numbers 11. We're looking at 25 and 26. Here it says, the Lord came down the cloud, spoke to him and took of the spirit. You see, it just says the spirit. It just says the spirit rested upon them. But when we go to the Aramaic, it makes it a little bit more clear. You know, this is one of the reasons why I like sometimes to compare verses in different Bibles. Something I learned many years ago, because we often talk about the King James Version being the version of the Bible, if you want to read it in English. But I remember noticing something years ago. I was reading the Hungarian version of the Bible. I was a missionary out in that country, and so I started to learn to be able to speak Hungarian, and I had to read the Bible in Hungarian. And I looked at John chapter 1 and verse 1. And there it said something very interesting, because in the English it says, in the beginning is the word. In the Hungarian, it said, in the beginning is the eager. And this word eager doesn't translate to be word, it translates to be verb. So in the Hungarian, it said not just that in the beginning was the word, it said in the beginning was the doing word, the verb. And so it referred to Christ as being the doing word. And when I first read that, I thought, wow, doesn't that give just an extra little bit of insight into exactly who Christ was as the word of God? We're going to move on and we're going to stay looking at the Targum. And again, I would say to you, look up in your Bible, see the difference. Here we're looking at Numbers chapter 27 and verse 18. And the Lord said to Moses, take to thee Jehoshua bar Nun, a man upon whom abideth the spirit of prophecy from before the Lord, and lay thy hand upon him. So as we look at these three different verses from the Old Testament, we can see that for the Jews, the idea of their having, of their being the spirit of prophecy within the presence of the church, this is not a new thing. And so when we go back to Revelation, when we go back to chapter 12 and verse 17, we can read it again and say, well, the dragon was wroth with the woman, went, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the spirit of prophecy, that prophetic spirit within their church. And interestingly, where it says have the testimony of Jesus Christ, in the Greek, the word is echo, and it means to have as in to possess. So they're possessing that spirit. So there are two spiritual marks of the end time church. First of all, number one, they keep all the commandments of God. And of course, I'm going to say it, including the fourth commandment, because that seems to be the main commandment where a lot of churches fall over. They don't keep the fourth commandment. So here's a church keeps all the commandments of God. Now think for a minute, how many denominations actually do that? Any 
Now, I can think of a few. There's the Seventh-day Baptists. There's the Worldwide Church of God. There's the, um, oh, I think it's the Seventh-day God of Assembly. There's actually quite a few denominations beyond the Seventh-day Adventists and the Reformed Seventh-day Adventists and this group and that group. So we've then got to look at the second criteria. The second criteria is that they have prophecy. They have the prophetic gift in their midst. Now, here are the two clauses. There we are, kind of raced ahead of this slide. Now let's have a look at a quotation from G.I. Butler in his book, Visions and, sorry, in his article, Visions and Prophecy, that was in the Review and Herald, on the 2nd of June, 1874, he asked this question. He says, is there a people in whom these conditions combine in these last days? We believe they truly do in Seventh-day Adventists. They have everywhere claimed to be the remnant church for the last 25 years. Do they keep the commandments of God? Everyone knowing anything about this people can answer that this is the most important part of their faith. In regard to the spirit of prophecy, it is a remarkable fact that from the first of their existence as a people, Seventh-day Adventists have claimed that it has been an active exercise amongst them. Now, it's all very well to claim that you've got this active exercise of the spirit of prophecy that you've actually got a prophet within your church but it's a different thing to actually test that prophet to see if that prophet fills the the four biblical proofs of a prophet so let's have a look now at the four biblical proofs number one harmony with the bible or to put it another way, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, this is what Isaiah says, if they don't speak according to the law and the testimony, it's simply because there is no light in them. So when we look at the spirit of prophecy, when we look at the gift of Ellen White, within the church and we look at her books and here are some of the more well-known books desire of ages christ's object lessons thoughts from the mounts of blessings and lastly steps to christ you know steps to christ i found to be a very a wonderful book a book that i personally struggle to read but actually it does exactly what it says on the cover it leads you to christ Christ's object lessons, talking about all the different parables that Christ gave, and then thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. What a wonderful description of the Beatitudes that's found there, going through all the blessings. Ellen White was known very well for her books enhancing the Bible. And in fact, she said very clearly that her books were the lesser light, pointing to the Bible as the greater light and you'll notice that i haven't said too much about the desire of ages well that's because the desire of ages actually fulfills the second biblical proof of a prophet because first of all the writings must be in harmony with the bible and let me point this out that when i first came to seventh day adventism i kind of struggled with this idea of there being this prophet and the idea that she was writing these books. And I thought to myself, well, these people, they seem to be following these books more than they're following the Bible. And perhaps that's a fault that could be laid at our door, that sometimes we're too quick to quote Ellen White rather than quoting the Bible. But what I found was that as I read her books and as I tried to see where these areas were of, of what I thought was contradiction, sometimes I would read something and I would say, well, that's not biblical. But you know, I was pointed within her writings themselves. They would point me to the Bible, to the very spot where I could see, ah, that's how she's able to write that because somehow she had this deep knowledge of what was in the Bible. Now, the second proof, witnessing Jesus. John wrote in 1 John chapter 4 
and verse one. He said, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Here is John saying, listen, don't just accept. Somebody comes along and says, I'm telling you this, I'm getting a message from Jesus. Try them, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And this is how you know if that person has the spirit of God, because every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, let's go back to this wonderful book, The Desire of Ages. Ellen White, when she wrote The Desire of Ages, she was writing about Jesus. And, you know, this is probably her best known book. It's been read by millions of people around the world. And it contains this with pages. Uh, this is on page, oh, I'm going to look to see which page it is. It's page 152. And here it says, we should all become witnesses for Jesus. Social power sanctified by the grace of Christ must be improved in winning souls to the Savior. Let the world see that we are not selfishly absorbed in our own interests, but that we desire others to share our blessings and privileges. Let them see that our religion does not make us unsympathetic or exacting. Let all who profess to have found Christ minister as he did for the benefit of men. Ellen White consistently called for Christians to witness Christ, and she consistently called for a witness in a certain way. In fact, in the Ministry of Healing, page 143, there she talks about Christ mingling with men as one who desired their good, one who sympathized with them, dealt with their problems, and then said, follow me. And this is the pattern that is being followed in our churches today. We are going out mingling with people. Now, if ever there was a time when people needed you to go out and show that Christ-like sympathy, it's now. People are suffering because of this pandemic, not necessarily just because they have caught the disease. Some are suffering because others have caught the disease, because they've lost loved ones. Or maybe they're leaving, leading a more restricted life at the moment, which means they can't get out to the, and do their shopping. Uh, they can't go and visit each other. Do you know mental illness is increasing at the moment because people have become isolated. People can't get out and socially interact. And so part of the work that we need to be doing is to go out and have communication with people. You might not be able to go and speak to them, but you may be able to go and do something that we started doing was going to people's houses, knocking on the door and then running off and standing by the gate so that we were more than two meters away. But then we could have conversation. We could talk with them. We could pray with them. We could show them that we hadn't forgotten them, that there was still life outside those four walls that they were stuck within. Now is the time for us to be working exactly as Christ told us to work, to go ye therefore. And remember the idea when you go ye therefore, it's not just to preach the gospel at people, but it's to go out and teach people rather than preach, but also to sympathize with them and help them out with their problems. We need to be people who are practical people, who are going to those around us and saying, we understand your concerns, we understand your needs, we are here to help you. Now let's move on to test number three of the four tests. Here it is, test number three is fulfilled prophecy. Now, it's all very well for somebody to stand up and to say that they are a prophet, but have they actually prophesied? Have they said something which has then come to pass? Now, you may remember around the time that, um, the, so that the, yes, that the Adventist church was coming into existence, and certainly around the time when Ellen White started to receive visions and messages from God, 1848, we looked at this, in a previous study when we looked at ghosts and spirits in Hydesville, New York, B. 
began the modern revival of spiritualism, the idea of being able to speak to the dead. It began in this house here, the house of the Fox family. And you will note that within two to three years, there were 30,000 examples of spiritualist activity. Within 10 years, there were one and a half million followers. Now, Anne White, who was contemporaneous to this time, so she was living at that time, she said this in her book, Early Writings, page 59. She said, I saw that soon it will be considered blasphemy to speak against the rapping and that it would spread more and more. Now, this rapping, this was the Rochester rapping, the first communication that this, this supposed spirit had with the Fox children, where it was knocking and, and communicating with the young boy there. She said it would spread more and more that Satan's power would increase and some of his devoted followers would have the power to work miracles and even to bring down fire from heaven in the sight of men. And you may remember, this is in the book of Revelation there, that it says that these apostate churches will have the power to bring down fire in the sight of men. She said that it would grow and that, that soon you would not be able to speak against it. And certainly spiritualism has grown to such an extent that if you turn on your TV, if you go to the cinema, the films that are coming out of Hollywood, the TV programs and series that are being produced speak openly about spiritualism, about witchcraft, as if this is something normal and something natural. Now, a hundred years after Ellen White wrote, out came this book, the centennial book of modern spiritualism in America. And this is what it had to say. It said, neither priest nor press should uncharitably speak of or touch this holy word spiritualism. Only with clean hands and pure hearts and spiritualists themselves should honor their blessed gospel of immortality. Now, there's a couple of things I want to mention here. First of all, only with clean hands and pure hearts. I mean, hey, they're, they're just adopting biblical phraseology. They have now become such a holy people that they can pseudo quote the Bible. But secondly, remember what Ellen White had written a hundred years before, that it would soon be considered blasphemy to speak against the rapping. Here then, it's written in this book, neither priest nor press should uncharitably speak of or touch this holy word, spiritualism. Suddenly, spiritualism had become holy. A great deception. But one thing I want to say, you know, I can testify today that spiritualism is defeated. I was brought up in a spiritualist household. My mother was a spiritualist. She attended spiritualist rescue circles. She went in, into trance and went into the, the, the spirit realm. When I first became a Christian, I went to her and I wanted to bring Christ to her. And I wanted to tell her of, of the wonderful thing that I'd found in the Bible and in Jesus Christ. But she forbade me to speak of it on pain of being thrown out of the house. My mother accepted a lot from me. There was a lot of things I could do in front of my mother and she would never reject me. But when I wanted to testify of Jesus Christ, that's when she rejected me. That's when the spiritualist part of her took over. Now, the interesting thing is that many years later, my mother watched my children, little children, three and four years old, four and five maybe, in prayer, in family worship. And as she watched them, her heart was touched. Jesus was able to reach out to her. And six months later, she went into the watery grave of baptism and became a Seventh-day Adventist. And when she attended the church where my wife and I had our wedding reception, my mother almost recoiled as she went in there because she said this was the very spiritualist church that I used to attend years ago. And that spiritualist church was no longer in existence. Now the building had been bought by the Seventh-day Adventists and they raised up a Seventh-day Adventist church on that very spot. 
Well, let's move on. I don't want to take up much more time. We're down now to test number four. Test number four is what is called the orchard test. Do you know what I mean when I refer to the orchard test? Well, let's have a look. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. Or in other words, you can plant a tree. When the tree grows up, if it doesn't bear any fruit, then what good is it? So we want to look at the work of Ellen White. Did it actually pass the orchard test? Now, Ellen White lived and worked for 70 years, and during that time she was under the critical eyes of people who for the most part were, were skeptical, were doubtful, were suspicious, and sometimes openly hostile towards her. Yet throughout her lifetime, her fruits remained. People tested her as to whether she really was going into the, the, this visionary state. At one time, as a young, frail woman, she held up, as you can see in this picture here, she held up a family Bible. Now, you can see it in the picture there, but in those days, a family Bible, that was a serious thing. I mean, I've got, I've got a Bible here that's a heavy old Bible, but it's nothing compared to the family Bibles. The family Bibles were well, the huge books, they were designed to be to be a record of the family. You would have genealogies written in there. You could put, even if you were, if you could afford to have pictures taken, you would have pictures of the family put in there. It was a book that the whole family could gather around and read at one time. Very heavy book. Um, I've got one book here, a book on natural remedies. You can see this is kind of quite a thick book. Now, if I pick this up with one hand, of course, I'm a strapping, healthy young man. Young. I can hold this book up in my hand, but for how long can I actually hold this book in the air before I start to feel the strain, before it starts to weary my arm, before I have to put it down? Alan White picked up one of these family Bibles. She picked it up in one hand and held it above her hand and then with the book open moving the pages without being able to see the page she started to point out the different verses that she was referring to as you can see in this picture somebody stood on a chair so that they could actually see was she actually quoting those verses and they found that she was in fact all the different attributes of somebody uh, receiving the word from god were fulfilled by ellen white but Let's have a look at this orchard test because I want to take this a, a step further. Here where we're going to look at two specific churches because in the mid 19th century, there were two groups that emerged from a Christian revival in the USA. There was a church called the Advent Christian Church and there was the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, here's a, one of the first Seventh-day Adventist churches, 1862. Seventh-day Adventist church was incorporated in 1863, and here is one of the first churches that they had. And then you have this other church, as I say, this is the Advent uh, Christian church, the first Advent Christian church. Uh, this is a church that was raised up in 1881, so almost 20 years later what was the main difference that they held very very similar teachings the main difference between the two was the spirit of prophecy the dreams and visions of ellen white now today the advent christian church is still in existence it numbers around thirty thousand people what about the seventh day adventist church a church that grew up pretty much at the same time. Now, as I recall, at last count, what do we have? Something like 18 million people around the world? Can you see the difference? Over more than 150 years, one church has had very small growth. The other one has had phenomenal growth. What is the difference? Well, the main difference between these two churches was that one had the spirit of prophecy and one didn't. Now, we can ask ourselves, why does God send a prophet to his church? And 
The answer comes back as a very simple answer. The prophet comes with a special message for the end time church. It's a call for reformation. It's a call to evangelism. Now, if we had more time, I would quite probably go into a series on the Reformation because, you know, the Reformation was something wonderful that happened. Around the time that the church was coming out of the wilderness, there had been a Reformation going on for a couple of hundred years within the church. Actually, for longer than that, it started around the 13th century with Wycliffe writing his Bible. And then came people like Martin Luther, who rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church almost unintentionally. He didn't really want to start a new church. He just wanted to reform the, the Catholic Church. That was why it was called the German Reformation. And then you had, there was Jan Hus, who I believe went before him, that also saw a need to reform the church. And then you had other people coming in, the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley, for example, um, people bringing all different doctrines, the Anabaptists who had discovered baptism by immersion, so eventually the Baptist church had come into play, then you'd have the Seventh-day Baptists, and then you had William Miller's revival movement that was probably the, almost the end of the Reformation, putting the final part onto the Reformation, having seen all the reforms coming in the church, now was this idea that Christ is coming soon. And 160, 170 years ago, actually perhaps more now, there, this cry went out that Christ is coming, get ready for the return of Christ. And then by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, the Seventh-day Adventist church has been established, established on the foundation of keeping the Ten Commandments, but a little bit of imbalance in the message. By the time we get to the 1880s, 1888, you get uh, A.T. Jones and E.G. Wagner that came along and said, look, we're emphasizing the Ten Commandments too much. We need to put some balance into the message. We need to speak about the righteousness of Christ. We need to talk about righteousness by faith, taking it full circle back to Martin Luther. And then the church began to blossom. Within the writings of Ellen White, there was this call, a call for reformation and a call for evangelism as well. This was echoing Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through to 20. Quite often we talk about uh, Matthew 28, verse 19, but actually let's start a verse before and finish a verse after. Jesus came and spoke to them, that's the disciples, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And let me just emphasize this. He didn't say some power. He didn't say a bit of power. He said all power is given to me. And because I have all power, I can then send you. I can say, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now, this idea of teaching. This is not going out and telling people what to do. Yes, teachers do tell things, but the idea of a teacher is that you help someone to grow. You nurture that person. And so as you are imparting the gospel, so they are growing in gospel grace, growing in the grace of Jesus Christ. And it said, baptize them, bring them into the fold of Jesus. And when you baptize them, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, because there were these three persons of the Godhead that were working hard to bring every repentant sinner back into the fold. You know, God would not have one of us die. If it had only been you or me that had sinned, Christ would have come just for us. He would have gone to the cross just for us. This is why it's such a precious gift that's been given to us. Unlike all the other religions, in all the other religions, you had to work, you had to do something, you had to fight and struggle, never knowing if you were going to be accepted by the God that you were following. Yet when you come to Christianity, when you come to the true Jehovah God, 
he says, I don't want you to be lost. And so that I can ensure that you're not lost, I will pay the penalty for your sin. What does that mean? That I don't have to do anything? That I'm just automatically saved? Oh, no. There's one thing you have to do. You have to give back to God the one thing that he's given you. Because God has given you free will. God has given you the power of choice. So now it's up to you to choose to give yourself over to Christ. And when you do, he says, I will come to you. I will send my Holy Spirit to be within you. I will cause you to keep my commandments. You will follow me. I will be your God. You will be my people. And he talks about his people as being his bride. And in the same way that a groom longs for his bride, you know, I remember the, the days before I got married, I was longing to be with my wife. And then when the wedding came, from that time onwards, we've been able to stay together. And we've been together now for 34 years this year. What a wonderful experience that has been. Imagine Christ longing to unite with his church, to say, I just can't wait until I can come, gather my people to me so that we can spend not 30, 40, 50 years, but eternity together. Christ says, teach the people around you. Teach them to observe whatever I have commanded you, and I will be with you, even right until the end of this world and into the world made new, into the new heaven and the new earth that Christ has in store for us. So this evening, as we are here together, as we are spending our last time, and let me just get rid of, I don't know what happened to me there, it seemed almost as if the Lord was taking me off to be with him up in the stars already. But I just want to impress this upon you. If this should be the last time that we get to be virtually together like this, if this should be the last time that I'm able to speak to you, I want to say, turn your life over to Christ. There is nothing better that you can do with your life. And he is longing and waiting for that full surrender. I don't care whether you surrendered your life to him 20, 30, 40 years ago, whether it was five years ago, whether it was only last week. Christ today is knocking on the door of your heart and saying, give me yourself. Surrender yourself to me and I will take you, I will shape you, I will mold you, I will make you into that perfect reflection of me. If it's your desire today to surrender yourself once again to Jesus Christ, to say to him, Lord, I am here and I want to be with you. I want to be your child. Then I'm going to invite you to close this evening in a word of prayer and surrender to our Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have brought us into your precious truth, that we have seen that you do have a people on this earth who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. We have seen that there is a church that has the testimony of Jesus Christ, and we are thankful, Lord, that we have the lesser light that continually points us towards the greater light. Lord, if we had read our Bibles like we should, we wouldn't have need for the spirit of prophecy. But you knew the way things would go on this earth. You made provision for us and you said, I will send you a light to lighten your path, to guide you towards the great light. So this evening, Lord, as we are here before you, I pray that for every head that is bowed here, Lord, I ask that you will take full charge as we surrender ourselves to you, that you will indeed be our God, that you will take away from us the desire from sin, that you will forgive us 
of our sins, that you will lead us in the paths of righteousness so that we may indeed fulfill that great commission that you've given. And when we see that the clouds will be broken up and we see that bright light of the coming of our Lord and Savior, that we will be able to lift our heads up high and say, Lo, here is our God. We have waited for him as you come to take us home with you. Bless each head bowed here, each person that has surrendered themselves anew. Lord, I pray that you will send an extra portion of your Holy Spirit so that we may commune with you and we may grow in your likeness. Bless us to this end is our prayer. And we pray all of this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.